Welcome back to EAK TV. I'm your host Gia Gold and we are here at Istanbul Blockchain Week 2024. Another year stronger. And here I am with a co-founder of Animoca Brands, Mr. Yatsu. How are you doing, Mr. Yatsu? I'm very good, thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Istanbul is a beautiful city, so always look forward to come to a place that is so has so much cultural relevance uh, you know, in the history of, of society. Is it your first time to arrive here? No, I've been to Istanbul before. Uh, last year, you know, there was uh, a couple other sort of Web3 events. But I remember actually long, long time ago as a child, I actually visited, uh, visited Istanbul. Um, that was decades ago. Decades ago, all right. So when you think of Istanbul, you know, what do you think of? Is it like more the culture or food? Well, definitely for me, it's culture. Uh, I actually have a deep interest in history. So I actually think of Istanbul in the context of Constantinople. For me, that's kind of sort of the historical aspect that becomes fascinating, interesting, and the whole sort of Ottoman Empire, the backgrounds around that. So, so to me, it has that uh, sort of you know, meaning for me. Um, I, you know, the food is wonderful here. I haven't had that much of it, but you know, it's, uh, I'm a fan, so yeah. So have you tried any Turkish delights that you can recommend us? Uh, do you mean the actual Turkish delights? Yeah, I mean the, the, you know, the, the sweets in themselves. Uh, I generally like uh, like the food that I've had here, um, and 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 from from my perspective, actually, uh, I grew up actually in in Austria as a child, mm -hmm. and so we actually had a lot of Turkish communities in there. So a lot of uh, sort of Turkish food culture, you know, uh, ranging from kebabs all the way to actual Turkish delights and so on, actually were in the country. So and I had uh, you know friends, for, you know, I had Turkish friends as well. Again, decades ago. So yeah. I see. So what do you think of the Turkish market so far? Well, when you're thinking, if the question is related to Web3, right, then, you know, the Turkish markets right now feel to us a much more consumer-driven market. So there seems to be less institutional uh, backing as it is in some other countries, but much more heavier, I guess, user retail component here. Um, you know, you have a lot of active traders, maybe not as much yet in DeFi as it is in other places. A lot more activity seems to be centered around centralized exchanges versus things that are in the sort of decentralized systems. But, you know, that's part of the evolution. I mean, and, I, you know, demographically, the region is very young. And therefore, I think digital assets, blockchain tokens are more native to that audience. So I think it's natural that a place like Turkey would have faster adoption. That's a pretty interesting take. So we're con continuously evolving and we're getting there. You know, so let's dive deep into Animoca brand. So what was the driving force behind your early adoption of blockchain technology and how did it shape your company's vision? Animoca's mission is delivering digital property rights. We basically said that all along. The vision really started when we saw what it could do for gaming. Because in the gaming world, people actually don't have the ability to own their digital assets, even though they spend so much money on it, right? I mean, you know, on average, uh, annualized, people spend $100 billion on virtual goods. That's like skins and trinkets and other things they play inside games. But they don't own them. So we thought, well, what would the world look like if actually the gamers who love their, their, their sort of the assets, the status symbols and the meaning that it means to them, actually be one that they could own and then bring it to other games or share it to other people or maybe even trade it if they wanted to. That's how it started. But since then, Animoca has evolved much more from the gaming world into the broader Web3 ecosystem. We've invested in L1, L2s. We have over 540 portfolio companies. Uh, of course, we have metaverses like you know, Sandbox, for instance, um, but also you know, our own Mochaverse, which is basically an ID and identity solution. These are all things that help proliferate the growth of Web3. And the mission, as I said, is digital property rights. And why it's important is that we think it's a way in which everyone can now own something in this future internet. That's something you couldn't do before. I love that you mentioned about property rights. So let's talk about the, the one that you mentioned about gaming and metaverse. So it's been evolving so quickly, right? The landscape of gaming and metaverse. What are your predictions for the future of, of these industries? And how is an Imoca brand positioning itself to lead in this space? So we project that in the next 12 to 18 months, there's going to be hundreds of millions of users going into Web3, actually decentralized Web3. So I don't mean exchanges, through uh, Web3 gaming, culture, and entertainment. Now, we, you know, this is where I reveal that I'm a little older than perhaps some people, in the sense that I've experienced the first wave of the internet in the 90s, and then Web2 basically going into, you know, from the evolution of 
essentially the social web, you know, uh, with, with companies like Facebook and of course the growth of Apple and so on. So we've seen these evolutions. And I think Web3 to me is a little bit like a reboot of what Web1 should have been. Uh, but the only difference is that in essentially Web3, now we have the ability to own essentially sort of the time and attention that we're generating uh, in Web1. And what are the things that we do in Web1 and Web2 that actually captures most of the value, if not all of the value? Is it the infrastructure? Is it the base layers? Is it the telcos? No, it's culture. Mm -hmm. It's gaming, it's things we do with search, it's things we do finding restaurant bookings, you know, services, things that actually all meet, in most cases, a cultural end. And that's actually why we are investing so heavily and focus so much on digital culture. And what is the best way to express digital culture? We think NFTs. Mm -hmm. But one of the interesting things is that culture permeates in the Web3 space in more than just NFTs. So for instance, the proliferation of meme coins, whether you agree with them or not, are actually forms and expressions of digital culture as well. And that's why, to us, when you look at the growth of digital culture, we can't look at it only in the context of what's happening in NFTs. We also have to look at it with the launch of especially meme coins, how that's sort of translating into the world. And much of that growth will come, in our perspective, from what's happening with Telegram and Ton. Uh, and we're, as you know, uh, we're investors in, in them, and we're also the biggest validator in Ton. And that's actually one way as a platform that we think will bring mass adoption into the early stages of, you know, basically Web3 users, particularly in gaming and entertainment. You can see this with Gamey, for instance, or also with Hamster Combat, or, you know, other, other fun little applications that are coming out there which is kind of similar to how mobile games evolved back in 2010, 2011. I mean, remember Angry Birds or maybe Flappy Bird, Angry Bird right? Yes. You know, these, these are, you know, people look at those games and say, oh, that doesn't seem like a very serious game, but they became really popular. And really what they did was they again facilitated a kind of mass adoption to a certain type of platform. So we're kind of in that era before it starts evolving to the next stage. So we're pretty bullish about the space. Uh, and also ultimately, you know, when you think about NFTs, we think of NFTs as the ultimate status symbol and sort of symbolic cultural capital that you want to have in the digital world. You know, and whether this is a board ape or a pudgy penguin or a crypto punk or a mochaverse, that depends on the end user. But in the physical world, we have these expressions too. Is it a Birkin bag? Is it a Rolex? Is it a Ferrari? You know, is it a nice place you live in? These are all kinds of cultural expressions. And where do we spend most of our money? In the physical world. We spend it on that stuff. Right. And we think that's what's gonna happen in Web3 as well and those will be basically NFTs. But we're currently at a stage of the development where it's mostly about economic capital. And once that sort of capital starts to build up, then they're going to want to invest it in other ways that proliferate and sort of promote their social status, and that's going to be NFTs. So you're saying, are you still bullish on NFTs right now? Massively so. I mean, think about what are the value items to us in our own culture, in our own meaning. They're non-fungible in nature. I mean, they're not the fungible stuff, right? It's, you know, the house you lived in, or maybe the asset you have, maybe a painting, maybe, a, maybe even, you know, your children's writings or drawings, you know, we don't throw them away. Why? Because they have some kind of sentimental cultural value to us, right? And think about everything you purchase. If we were not buying for social and cultural reasons, then we'd all be wearing the same clothes. You wouldn't be wearing a nice dress, you would, you know, you know, we'd all be wearing exactly the same type of outfits because we would only care about the utility. But in reality, we want to express ourselves. We want to express our social cultural identity. And the only way to do that is to do it in a non-fungible way. I mean, what if you walk into an event or a gala dinner and everyone wore the same dress? Mm, probably not so cool, right? Um, but actually, in you again, it's the same. It's the same idea. I like that you mentioned about that. And also I think like people like to memorialize things and blockchain makes it possible, right? Absolutely. So think about all the things that you want to memorialize in the digital world that you couldn't do before. All the people who play games, they actually want to be able to sort of say, I did this when I was 20 years old. But you lose that. And the only thing that you remember is what's in your head. But actually you want to be able to pass it on to the next generation. You know, people who played maybe successful, you know, maybe someone was a championship gamer, maybe someone did really well, maybe someone just spent 100 hours on something, whatever those are, these are achievements you want to take with you. These become actually heirlooms in the physical world, and we ha didn't have a way to have these digital heirlooms. And with NFTs and with blockchain and Web3, you can now have them. I agree with you 100%. So, it seems like you were a gamer before in the past. What games would you play before? 
well, I used to work for a gaming company. Uh, I, in the 80s, okay, now I'm really dating myself, <laughs> I used to work for Atari. And Atari was one of the, and this is before the Atari of today, you know, was, uh, you know, one of the biggest gaming companies back then. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I played, uh, you know, multi-user dungeons, those were text-based games, and then eventually evolved to, of course, you know, um, you know uh, the MMORPGs like World of Warcraft and all that type of stuff as well. And I still play games today, not just Web3 games, just as a way to sort of, you know, learn about the space. And it's fun. I just don't have as much time as I used to. What games are you playing right now? Well, I mean, you know, outside of the Web3 games, whether it's like the, the games from the Motorverse or Axie Infinity, some of the games on Gamey, you know, in the Web2 world, I, I, do, I do still occasionally play Apex Legends. Um, you know, it's a very good, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty decent shooter, and it's also what my kids play. Uh, I sometimes play Minecraft because there's a lot of community members there as well. Again, parallels to Sandbox, you know, this is also how we learn. And also playing other, other games is also a way in which you can learn about the space. That's awesome. So, what's your Web3 hot take and unpopular opinion that you can share with us? So, I don't know about unpopular opinion. It depends who you talk to. But I would say in my hot take on Web3 is that I think Web3 will solve capitalism and make it a more fair form of capitalism. I also say that if you're generally someone who is more socialist in your thinking, maybe Web3 is not for you. Right? Maybe that's the hot take. Um, and I think one of the big controversies we have, for instance, in particularly in the West, people sometimes dislike um, blockchain gaming. They don't like Web3 gaming. But what don't they like about it? Well, we think what they don't like about it is the financial aspect. But what's scary about the financial aspect isn't the fact that there's value involved. Right. It's the fact that it's capitalist. Mm -hmm. And when you look at, for instance, the trends that you see in Europe and in parts of America, particularly with young Americans, surveys have shown that most of them are now veering more socialist in thinking. Mm -hmm. right? We think that's because they haven't benefited from capitalism. That's why they think it's negative. If you go to Asia, it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. People love Web3 games. They, right. they love NFTs. They love blockchain. Because 30, 40 years ago, they didn't have property. They didn't have a way in which they could earn anything and have value because they didn't have any rights to them, and they didn't have they didn't have capitalism. So that's the that's the contrast we see there. So so I but but again, I, we truly believe that Web three actually will help solve um, sort of equity, the equity issues we have in the world, because it can actually broaden capitalism. So maybe ultimately that could be maybe the hotter take, which is that I think Web three will proliferate more capitalism in the world. That's a very interesting take. Actually, I'm from the Philippines, so Axie Infinity was hot, like the last bull run there. And also, I think, like some parts of Indonesia as well. That's right, and also in parts of South America. And while you can see some of the controversial aspects about capitalism, which is the volatility that we saw in the Philippines with Axie Infinity, how many millions of people in the Philippines actually became involved in Web3, mm -hmm. started having a wallet, mm -hmm. became financially included in a system where they before couldn't even have a bank account. And what's interesting now is that your regulator in the Philippines has been supportive of crypto. He, in fact, opened up a sort of uh, Web3 gaming conference, which would never happen in many other countries, precisely because it's had such a big impact in places like the Philippines. It's good that, you know, it's reaching people who, you know, who we're never thought of like reaching before. So, um, yeah, so what should startup know about racing in the current market? And how does this compare to one year ago? So you talked about, you know, tapping games on Telegram. So how do you think it will change in terms of like, you know, raising funds for startups? So first of all, uh, it's important to note that, you know, we have done, you know, many investments this year. I think maybe already 80 or so investments just this year alone, uh, possibly more. And we're not the only ones investing. You can see. So actually, despite the fact that the market is obviously tougher than it was three years ago, um, certainly better than last year, right? Uh, actually, there's still a lot of investment capital coming into the space, even more so. So the key is not, is capital scarce? What's actually key is, is your product good? Is your mission worthy? Are you as a founder understanding what it is that you're building? And often in Web3, people are building networks and they're basically raising for the network, which is basically raising a token. And so we find often that if founders can really express sort of what network effect they're trying to build and the value they're trying to build with this, uh, then that actually helps with that. It's very often, I think, people who don't understand Web3 look at tokens simply as an instrument to raise money. Mm -hmm. But they don't actually understand how it builds networks, how it actually enhances the value of you know, your product or your user ecosystem that you're trying to build. Basically, you use tokens to build bigger network effects. Mm -hmm. 
and that's actually what the purpose is of a token in many cases. But in, in, we still meet founders, for instance, from time to time who don't understand that, who treat it as a quasi-equity instrument, who don't, under, who don't really focus deeply on the network utility and the network expansion of the tokens. And I find that difficult sometimes, and obviously these projects have difficulty raising um, because they don't understand the, those constructs. Uh, and I think there's a lot more knowledge, right? Like three years ago, we would argue that the knowledge of you know, what Web3 company is and, and the tokenization around that might be still earlier, right? So people had sort of more loose understanding and now it's honing down more. Like tokens are you know, representations of network effects. It's about digital property rights. It's about user empowerment. It's about how you share value, right? These are things that are much more clearer to us and therefore if we look for founders who understand that more um, than before. That's a very insightful, you know, take that you just told us. So what can you advise the founders, entrepreneurs who are just starting in the Web3 space right now? Well, like with anything that you're building in the Web3 space, and thank you for doing so, because every person who's building in Web3 is adding to the network effect and contributing. Even, even if the project doesn't become the biggest project ever, you're actually building network effects, right? No matter how big or small. But right? it's kind of like a little bit like you might have a neighborhood and if someone opens a restaurant, the restaurant might not be the most profitable thing ever, but it builds a network, it builds community. It makes the community stronger and have more value. So generally speaking, I think it's great that people are building just on that principle, and that's how we think about the space. But that also in order to know the space, you have to embed yourself into the culture. You can't just sort of, sort of fly in and start building. You have to know it. And I think of it a little bit like a country parallel. You know, I, I, I live in Hong Kong, and so obviously it's right next to China, right? No, no, technically part of China. Uh, and, you know, I remember in the 90s, a lot of people looked at China and said, that growth can't be real, the Chinese economy is fake, you know, all that type of stuff, right? Of course, now today China is the second largest economy in the world and a global powerhouse, right? I mean, just look at the Olympics. However, uh, what, I, what I also find really interesting is that the same people who visited China back in the 90s and 2000, they all came back convinced they understood the country or better and they said hey there's something real here I need to get to know about it and those people whether they were investors or whether they were working there had up found opportunity because they were early in those markets I think web3 is exactly the same you can't go into web3 without being in web3 the difference is that you don't need an air ticket you don't need a passport to fly you just need a wallet and you just need to enter the space and so my my message to anyone building in web3 is immerse yourself in the space don't just build your own product understand that culture in the same way that you think of a country like you want to do business in china you got to move to china a little bit if you want to do business in the philippines you got to move to the philippines right and understand that culture web3 is exactly the same uh, you can't take your web2 mindset and just say that same product will just you know be better in web3 you have to understand the culture of web3 I really like how you think, Mr. Yatsu, and what you said about immerse yourself in Web3. I immersed myself, and I fell down the rabbit hole, and I keep falling, <laughs> but I love it. And just to add to that comment, what's interesting is that notice how everyone that goes into the Web3 rabbit hole actually doesn't come out. And that actually demonstrates the power of what Web3 really is. You know, there's some projects or some things people do, and then they leave, and they never go come back again and say, that was it. But in Web3, it just goes deeper and deeper and deeper. That, to me, is actually its real power. The retention of Web3 is awesome. Do you think it's more because like, there's an emotional tie with it? I know when you trade, you should leave your emotions out of it. But the community, it makes you bond with them, you know, through ups, through down, through bear and bull. What's your take on that? So, I go back to the first thing I said earlier, which is, what is a token? A representation of network effect. What's the most valuable thing we're building? In actually Web 2 as well as Web 3, it's actually a network effect. The difference is that in Web 2, the network effect is owned by Facebook, it's owned by Apple, it's owned by Google. But in Web 3, you own the network. Who owns Ethereum? Who owns Bitcoin? Who owns Ton or Solana? These are actually owned by the users who are participating in those networks. And so when you think of it that way, then it starts to make sense why the community aspect is so valuable. Because in fact, the bigger and stronger the community is, the stronger the network, actually the more valuable the ecosystem. And so I like to think of it sometimes also a little bit as a kind of digital patriotism or nationalism. Not in a negative sense, but more in a kind of cohesive sense. When you have a country that's very patriotic, how strong is the network of that country? Very strong, right? If you love your country, if you love your fellow countrymen, if you want to protect it, that's a strong country. 
Whereas there are some countries where people want to leave. They don't want to stay there. They just want to extract or, you know, this is just temporary. Those are not very strong. You can think of networks exactly the same way. So what you just talked about the community and you're there for the community, you're actually building long-term relationships. But why do these relationships matter? Because you're building reputation with them. So right now, whether it's in Ronin or in Axie, or whether this is with you know, Mochaverse, or whether this is even with Ethereum, when you're in an ecosystem, you have built a reputation that you don't want to lose because at the end, our social reputation is much more, and cultural capital is much more important than just the economic. A network effect right there. So what's the daily routine of Mr. Yatsu? Can you walk us through like, you know, what is Mr. Yatsu's, you know, when you wake up, what do you do and how do you go through your day? Well, I mean, generally speaking, I try to start the day with uh, exercise. Uh, if I travel, which I'm doing a lot, then I tend to be in the gym. Actually, right now, you know, sometimes, you know, if the weather's nice, I will go for a run outside. It's really important to start your day, I think, in my sense, physical. Uh, I'm kind of an older guy, so in order for me to keep myself sort of, you know, active, I need to do things that, that do that. And then I typically start the day with, you know, doing difficult work. Mm -hmm. And I like to end the day, although that's harder sometimes, to work on things that are a little bit more sort of lighthearted and better. Mm -hmm. Because I think if you can end the day, not always an option, but if you can end the day with something that's positive, then actually you end the day nicely and then you can sleep better and you know life's better and then you refresh yourself and all that kind of stuff right um, but yes i mean between sort of giving talks and you know working on strategy and having calls with the team which seems like a pretty regular day i would say that the pattern tends to be physical in the morning if i'm back in hong kong i will walk my dog in the afternoon right uh, you know at the end of the day again that's another way i love nature for me nature is a way to sort of uh, sort of have a way in which i can reset right um, when you go hiking in some big mountains, that's how you get reminded, actually how small you are sometimes, right? right? And, and it's really important to all stay sort of humble as well and to know sort of, you know, you have an important role to play maybe and you could be privileged in that position, but that ultimately, you know, you serve a greater purpose. And that's to me, nature sometimes tells us, right? Like we want to live, I like to think that we want to live life with impact and purpose um, and that you can work and, you know, work on a mission that's greater than your own. That is such a very inspiring answer that you just told me. It makes me think now, is there any business book or any like personal development material that really shape your mindset that you can recommend us? So I'm not shaped by business books, but I'm definitely shaped by philosophers. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do study philosophy a fair bit, um, you know, all sorts, right? Um, and to me, I, uh, that makes me think about questions around really morality and justice. These are big topics. One of the things that you know, I, I, I generally agree with is that most problems, if not all problems in the world, are because of a lack or a sense of inequity. Mm -hmm. right? It's not just wealth inequity. It's, you know, it's unfair. If it's unfair, a problem occurs. Right? And so one of the things that I think tokens and Web3 are trying to address, which is the incentive alignment, is how can we create systems that are fairer or more just or more equitable effectively, right? Uh, and those are, and I think the answer is an ever-evolving thing. I don't think we will ever quite solve it, but many philosophers, not just economists, have tried to answer this question. And so I think the study of them actually are important. So I, I you know, I, I like Locke, uh, you know, John Rawls, for instance, uh, but also economists like, you know, like uh, Friedman or Hayek, like. And it's important to note that you don't have to religiously believe in everything they say, because there is also context in that moment in time, right? Uh, you know, you can take moral philosophy from Immanuel Kant, and that's really, really interesting, but you can't apply that philosophy in everything you do. It's probably impractical, for instance. But you can be inspired and in thinking about it. To me, that's really what it is. You, you have to be able to sort of, sort of go down that philosophical rabbit hole to be able to then understand better about, you know, uh, social behavior, human incentives, motivations, and getting closer to truth. I love that, that you said about getting closer to your truth. So for our last question, if you can describe Istanbul Blockchain Week in one word, how can you describe it? Energetic. Energetic, I love that. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Mr. Yatsu. We learned a lot, you know, in different aspects, actually, not only about Web3, but also, you know, the psychology itself. and. You know, thanks for sharing your daily routine with us. And I hope you, you enjoy your stay in Istanbul and also in Turkey.